Welcome to the Strong for Performance podcast, where we share wisdom and practical tips to help you grow stronger in all areas of your life. I'm your host, Meredith Bell. I interview experts who offer real world experiences that you can apply to your own journey. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. Welcome to another episode of the Strong for Performance podcast. I'm Meredith Bell, your host, and it's my privilege to bring you special guests who will inspire and challenge you. If you enjoy my show, I always appreciate when you rate and review it on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast platform. My podcast is sponsored by Performance Support Systems, publisher of software tools and books for improving the way people communicate at work. You can learn more at growstrongleaders.com. I'm really excited today to welcome as my guest, Todd Churches. Todd, welcome to my show. Thank you, Meredith. It's great being with you. And I want to give a special shout out before I do your formal introduction to another podcast host and friend, David Schreiner Kahn, because he's the one who introduced us. And I'm very yes. grateful for that yeah. because I've had a chance to read Todd's wonderful book. Thank before you. we jump into his book, though, let me tell you a little bit more about him. Todd is the CEO and co founder of. Big Blue Gumball, an innovative New York City-based management consulting firm specializing in leadership development and executive coaching. He's a three-time award-winning adjunct professor of leadership at NYU and a lecturer on leadership at Columbia University. Todd is also a member of Marshall Goldsmith's prestigious MG100 Coaches. He's also a TEDx speaker and the author of this wonderful book called Visual Leadership, Leveraging the Power of Visual Thinking in Leadership and in Life. Todd, I have to tell you, this is the most stunning and beautiful business book I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So I want to applaud you up front with all the visuals in color that you included in your book. It's Thank you, really Mary. something. I appreciate your saying that. Yeah, I was, my next book may be a pop-up book. I don't know, but uh, yeah, the, the color is, uh, well, that was one of the things when I, um, my book was published by Post Hill Press, Simon & Schuster, and they wanted to do it in black and white just because of the printing costs. Uh, and uh, I had to put my money where my mouth is and I had to pay for the color. I had to pay for the difference in the price between the color printing and the black. Because I've never, you know, as a first time author, um, you know, they're taking a, a gamble on you. They don't know if you'll sell two books, right? So um, they didn't want to make that investment. And so they said, if you're willing to do it, we're willing to do it. So it's hardcover, it's full color. And the reason it's so heavy, people keep saying it's the heaviest book, even though it's not uh, like 500 pages. Um, it's because of because of the color, they had to use extra little heavier paper. So it makes the book feel a little heavier but yeah so you definitely it's price per pound it's definitely uh i think people hopefully get their money's worth so so thank you for well checking. it's also a, a wonderful book with uh, so much value not just for leaders but anyone um who wants to help communicate their ideas more effectively so before we jump in let's back up a little bit and have you tell just a, a sh- you know a brief story about your journey from your business working inside corporations to forming your own business. Sure. I actually just did a presentation the other day. Um, my NYU class just wrapped up Tuesday night. And in my final class, I always pull back the curtain on my career and tell my students. So th- during the semester, they get little bits and pieces of stories along the way. And then the final session, I basically, so just I'll just show it to you, a little show and tell visually. This is my visual bio. So this is um, my whole career as a stepladder kind of um, visual representation. So long story short, I have a also, most people think I must have been a business major because I do management leadership training, executive coaching, but I was actually an English, English literature major with a concentration in Shakespeare and poetry. So my father said to me, what are you going to do with an English with a, sh- a major in Shakespeare or poetry, sit under a tree and rhyme? It's like, how are you going to make a living? So, um, But the foundation, we'll talk more about the book, is, is in storytelling, right? So whether you're... Um, 
you know, studying literature, you're studying business, it's all about stories. Stories have beginnings, middles, and ends. There are villains, victims, and heroes. There's a journey, there's a quest, there's obstacles to be overcome. So um, whether it's Shakespearean or, you know, plays or, or literature, um, it's all about story, right? It's all about character. And one of the things I say to my coaching clients and to anyone is that you're the lead character in your own life story. Right. And it's like, who do you surround yourself with? Who are the people in your life that that compose the, the the arc of your career and the movie of your life, basically? So that's one of the reasons the subtitle of my book is leveraging the power of visual thinking in leadership and in life, because it's not just a management leadership book. It really is intended to be for anyone. And one of the things I always say is that everyone's a leader, even if you're just leading your own life. It's not about having a title. It's not about having direct reports. It's literally about um, leadership is about, you know, we'll talk more about that, but it's about leadership in all its facets. Mm -hmm. Well, I just love, you're, you're a magnificent storyteller. Mm -hmm. And it was a fun book to read because of the way you tell your stories. You know, you, you poke fun of yourself at times and you just, you are a master at demonstrating through your book what it is you want people to be able to do after they read it. So to you, you really set the example Thank with you. how you wrote the book. Thank you. And I try to practice what I preach, whether it's in my coaching or in my teaching. Um, and in my classes, my students love the horror stories about the horrible bosses. They love hearing about when I, times I got laid off or fired. Um, because again, it humanizes you, makes you vulnerable. And a lot of students will put their professors on a pedestal, just like an employee might put their boss on the pedestal. But when you pull back the curtain and reveal the failures and the obstacles overcome, it humanizes you, it makes you more relatable, um, gives you more authenticity and credibility. And one of the other analogies visually, I keep this on my desk, my wife got me this. I don't, she, the, uh, the, the metaphor of the iceberg, right? Yes. What we see and what we know is just the tip of the iceberg, but we don't know when we first meet someone, the years of pain and suffering, the struggles, the failures that went into their becoming a quote overnight success. And that's with all of us, right? So, and one of the things I say, another metaphor is a lot of times we talk about a career path, but I always say it's not a path because that implies like a stroll in the park, you know, on stepping stones that are laid out for you. It's a career roller coaster of ups and downs, twists and turns, exhilarating highs, terrifying plummets. And that's kind of what my career has been like. Um, and in my TEDx talk, I talk about how when I was a kid, people would say, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I'd say, I want to be Superman. And they said, well, if you can't be Superman, what's your backup plan? And I'd say Batman. So it's like that was my vision of the future. What ended up happening is I ended up saying, all right, I can't be Superman or Batman, but I could go into the TV industry and the entertainment field in some capacity. And that's what I, that was my first career aspiration. So in terms of my career ladder, I started off in advertising at Ogilvy & Mather in New York. Um, and it was a kind of a numbers job. I was a media buyer. I really wanted a job in the creative side, but that didn't happen. And after a year of doing that, um, I wasn't happy in the job and I just needed a change. And I went out, I had my one week of vacation. I went out to LA to visit my college roommate and I saw that Hollywood sign and I said, this is where I belong. So I went back home to New York, gave my two weeks notice, shocked my parents by saying I'm leaving because I was like um, so out of my comfort zone and out of my personality to just pack up and move across the country with no money, no jobs, no connections. Uh, except for one roommate. Um, so uh, I took a risk and I did it. And uh, again, every, it's like Robert Frost here, you know, going back to poetry, Robert Frost, the road not taken, right? Two roads diverged in the yellow wood and you pick one or the other. And um, that's what I did. And that led me down the path that ultimately led me to doing what I'm doing today. Well, speaking of you going to LA, tell the story about the CEO you met and had a conversation with on the airplane. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, so um, my dream, as I mentioned, was to work in television and my dream network was NBC. I, and I was able to, I did a, uh, an internship at NBC in New York at 30 Rock the summer between when I got my bachelor's degree and my master's degree. So I got to go to 30 Rock every day for three months. And it's like, it was so exciting to be in that building where David Letterman was taping on one floor and Howard Stern was doing his radio show on another floor and the Today Show. And you just never knew, you know, Vanessa Williams, I was in the elevator with her alone. I almost passed out because I couldn't catch my breath. So it was like just being around that excitement. Um, so basically, after I tried so hard to get a, a job at NBC in New York, and I tried all the other networks, it just didn't work. And most of the TV jobs were in LA on the West Coast at that time. So anyway, so my parents dropped me off at JFK, bags packed, 
and I'm walking up the aisle to get to my seat in the back of the plane. And there's a guy in white, ha white haired gentleman blocking the aisle in first class. And I said, excuse me, can I get by? And he turned around and it was Grant Tinker, who is the CEO of NBC and former husband of Mary Tyler Moore. So it's like, here I am on this plane trying to go out to LA to get a job in the TV industry. And Grant Tinker, the CEO of NBC is on the plane. So even though, even though I, just to side note, even though I talk loud and fast because I'm from New York, I'm an extreme introvert. I'm a, I always say I'm a three B's guy, a back of the room behind the scenes bookworm. That's by nature, that's my personality. So the whole flight, I was like, should I go talk to him? Should I not go talk to him? My resumes were packed in my suitcase that was in check luggage. I didn't have one with me. So it's like, what do I do? And I kept going up to that curtain and chickening out and turning. I did that for like five hours, the whole flight. And finally we were over Vegas about to, you know, 45 minutes from landing in LA and I finally got the courage. I just stormed up there and I just said, excuse me, Mr. Tinker. And I just started rambling and saying, I'm moving to LA and I, my dream is to work for NBC. Do you have any advice for me? And he actually got up from his aisle seat, moved over to the window and said, have a seat for a second. So I'm sitting there in first class with the CEO of NBC, I'm 24 years old. He got me a Diet Coke from the, from the flight attendant and he gave me his card. So he talked to me for about five or seven minutes. He gave me his card and said, when you get out there, I probably won't have time to talk to you, but call my secretary and see if she could set you up some meetings for you. And she did. And none of those led directly to a job. They gave me the confidence and the hope and it just made it real. And um, I always tell that story because think about the leadership lessons there. One for me, just to have the courage to push myself out of my comfort zone, which was so out of character. But to him, the whole idea of servant leadership, he talked to me about and the fact that he was so generous. And I was talking about three G's, be, genu be genuine, be generous and be grateful. And he exemplified all three of those things. So that story always, yeah, that was tw age 24 and it just made such an impact on me of what a leader could, could be and the impact you could have on someone within five minutes, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many cool lessons. That story I just loved because there's so many things you could unpack around that when you are teaching, you know, one of your, your classes, or when you're presenting, you know, one of your workshops, I just, and so let's back up to the name visual leadership, which is an interesting spelling because you have it as one word with one L. Yes. So why did you choose that? And why is the visual aspect so important from your models that you present? Sure. The pros and cons of the word is people misspell it all the time, as you can imagine. The good thing is if you put it in as two words into Amazon, like visual leadership, my book comes up. So, um, so that's a good thing. The reason I have the word as a, as a single word, one, it's a brand and it's, not, it's actually now a copyrighted brand. I, I submitted it to the patent office. It was rejected the first two times, the third time they approved it. So it's now a registered service mark. So it's, it's a brand, but it also represents the fact that who you are and how you lead is inseparable from the lens through which you see the world, right? So with leadership, we always talk about who's a visionary leader or having a leadership vision. Um, my friend Oleg uh, Kostanov of, of just recently book, wrote a book called The Vision Code, which is one of the books that's somewhere, oh, there it is right behind me. Um, he does a whole book just on vision, right? How do you formulate your vision and how do you communicate your vision in a clear and inspiring way? That's central to leadership, right? The idea behind visual leadership, it's not only about your vision, but it's about helping other people realize their visions. So it's all about seeing. That's the common metaphor in all my work and, all, and throughout my book. This is all about seeing, watching, looking, noticing. Um, if you notice on the cover, it's a rainbow colored eye. Mm -hmm. And that represents the fact, and I came up with the, I, the reason there's a rainbow colored eye, I originally had a blue eye because my company was called Big Blue Gumball. So for branding, I wanted that consistency. And I realized that was not inclusive. And I got that feedback from people. And that even though I don't have blue eyes, it's still not representative. So the rainbow eye represents diversity, inclusion, belonging in all its forms, as well as innovation and creativity and all the colors of the rainbow. And the fact that you have a unique vision of the world and so does everyone else, right? So it reminds leaders that no one sees the world just as you do and ties into empathy and compassion. It ties into seeing things from other people's point of view. Um, and my concept of flipping the eye, which I came up with after I wrote the book, is about turning that eye on yourself and looking inwardly at your values, biases, assumptions, belief systems, and also reminds you to look at the world through uh, a different lens. So that's one of the mm -hmm. central themes. So that's the long story behind why that word. So it's a brand, but it's also a concept that represents what the, the foundation of my work is all about. Yeah. And you talk, of course, a lot about the visual thinking. Mm -hmm. So why don't you, you know, define that? Because that's going to sort of lay the groundwork for some of the, the other uh, models um, and um, 
the stories and metaphors that we're going to get into in your yeah, book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So often, you know, in the business world, we talk about words and numbers, which is great and it's fine. That's the centerpiece, but visual thinking is about thinking in pictures, and we kind of already do it. But the fact, the visual leadership concept, makes us aware of it and makes us more consciously intentional about how we do it and what we're seeing and what we're noticing. So it's about you know. A picture's worth a thousand words. Every culture, every language has that motto in some form. Napoleon said, a good sketch is better than a long speech. Confucius said similar things. Um, so just the idea of picturing something in your mind's eye, you know, mindfulness is such a hot topic. Visualization is, data visualization is a hot topic. How do you take numbers and communicate them using visual imagery, whether it's using graphs or charts or pictures, right? So this is all about a movement towards uniting um, Visual think there's a million books on leadership out there. There's a lot of books on visual thinking, design thinking. I kind of decided to combine the two and in a unique, unique way. And one of the things I always have to say to people, especially to senior leaders, is that um, people will say, oh, they suffer from ICD, which is I can't draw syndrome. They'll say, oh, I can't draw. So this doesn't really apply to me. It's not about drawing. It's about so much more than that, which we'll talk about. But it's basically about using visual imagery and visual language to get people to see what you're saying. How do you get an idea out of your head and into someone else's? All of my techniques are intended to do that. Well, speaking of drawing, one of, to me, uh, the most impactful stories is one you told early on where this one leader that you were working with was stuck. He had been struggling for all this time with these different areas, the Eastern and the Western mm -hmm. divisions. And I would love for you to share that story because you used an image to help him see it differently in just an instant. And I think people need to understand how quickly this kind of thing can happen. Yeah, yeah. Was, uh, one of my executive coaching clients, he was the vice president of one European country for a pharmaceutical company. And he had this issue with his VP of the East and the Western region, without going into all the details, it just wasn't working out for a variety of reasons. And I drew a circle, an oval kind of like to represent the country. And I said, right now it's East and West, but what if you divided it to North and South and gave this, the West guy, the North and the, this guy, the Eastern guy, the South, would that help? And it was so obvious to me that I almost didn't even suggest it because I didn't want him to think I was an idiot. And he said, oh my God, that's the solution. He's like, that would change everything. So it's like here, I, sometimes knowing less is actually helpful, you know, because you're not, but he was so bogged down with the details and the stress and the personalities and the numbers that it, I, I literally drew a, an oval and a line and that was it. And, I, and so that's why I say how my 30 second napkin sketch helped help to solve a client's problem um, that he had been wrestling with for about six months. Yeah, that was quite amazing. And it just goes to the point, you don't have to know how to draw. Yeah in order to be effective in this whole visual thinking and visual communication. Yeah, so, you could play Pictionary and Charades, you, can, you, you could do it, right? It's kind of like, <laughs> so if you could draw a straight line or even a semi-straight line or a circle or square, you could visually represent ideas. So it's, I always say it's not a test of your artistic abilities, it's a test of your ability to visually conceptualize something, get it out on some medium or paper so you can, represent an idea so that people could say, oh, I see it now because I'm looking at it as opposed to just hearing it. Well, I loved each chapter, you know, you started with the with an image and and that kind of set the tone. And of course, your chapter titles were curiosity evoking <laughs> as well. So it was like, all right, what's what's he going to talk about in this one? Mm. It, it, I, I just highly recommend your book. People Thank will you. enjoy it and also benefit from it. Let's look at um, why you structured it the way you did, because it was very easy to follow, you know, with the three main categories and then all the chapters that related to each one. Talk about those three areas. Yeah, I always talk about visual thinking. I break it down actually into four areas and I'll tell you why it's the, the sections in the book. So category one is using visual imagery, and or drawing. So that's using pictures, it could be objects, but it's just about something that you could look at. So for example, if I'm talking about, you know, to remind me to always be curious. So when I'm talking about curiosity, I have this on my desk, Curious George, right? So this is sitting on my desk. So it's stupid. It's like, here I am a college professor playing with a Curious George doll, but having this on my desk, Curious George represents to me kind of shaking up the status quo, asking why, always be curious, inquiring, digging deeper. So just again, this is a visual, right? There's no PowerPoint slide I didn't need to draw. 
uh, one of the things that we need to do as we go into the new hybrid workplace, and you know, I'm actually writing a blog post right now called the September Shuffle. Leaders, are you ready for the September sh September Shuffle? Because I think after the summer. People are getting their shots. They're going to want to enjoy their summer after a year and a half of hibernation. I think all craziness is going to break out after Labor Day because a lot of people, companies are going to call people back to work and they're people like, I'm not going or I'll come a couple of days. So there's a lot of, so the big thing is that we're going to need to be flexible. So I have my Gumby to remind me to be, always be flexible. And sometimes we have to bend over backwards to help our clients, right? So using humor and visuals, again, you're not going to forget these two. Um, I did a podcast recently with someone in London. He had never seen either of these characters. So that's another thing about visuals is not every analogy, metaphor, and example translates across cultures, right? Or across language and culture. So we need to remember that. That's one of the tips for, uh, we'll get to later. So category one is using visuals of any kind imagery, something you could see with your eyes, including drawing. Category two is using mental models or frameworks, right? So a company's organizational chart is a visual representation of the organizational structure. If you use a pyramid, um, like the like, uh, five dysfunctions of a team as a pyramid model, or there's staircase models, or there's a four box matrix, time management matrix or, or um, situational leadership, right? So anything that's a, 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 anything at the time where you're putting things in boxes. And one of the things I always say is thinking outside the box is a cliche now, but in order to think outside the box, you have to have something inside the box. So if you could create some kind of framework, take the complexity and messiness of the world, put in some kind of categorization so you could see it with your eyes, you're more likely to see solutions and then be able to think outside of that box. So even though it's become one of these cliches, I kind of like remove the cliche and say, why is it um, a good metaphor to begin with. So, and also that's another thing, all these categories are not mutually exclusive, there is overlap. So category two is models and frameworks. Category three is using metaphor and analogy, explaining something using something else, just like with Gumby represents flex, it's a metaphor for flexibility. So, um, and that's again where my poetry background really comes in handy because poetry and songwriters are, you know, most blog posts are metaphors. If you just, most people don't realize that. Look at most blog post titles and many book titles, and a majority of them are metaphorical, right? And we don't even think about that. So this makes us more aware of the metaphors we use and more strategic and intentional about the ones we choose to use. And category four is storytelling um, and humor, extra bonus points for humor if and when appropriate. So those are my four categories. And I break my book down into the categories of um, uh, models, metaphors and storytelling because visual imagery is the theme that carries throughout all the chapters. So that answers that, that question. But um, yeah, that's, so that's the foundation of all of my work. And you know, why visuals? I, always, I talk about this in my TEDx talk. Um, the three words, attention, comprehension, and retention. When you use visual imagery or visual language, it captures people's attention. It gets them to look into focus. It increases understanding because they could see it with their own eyes and like, okay, now I get it. Just like with that, um, napkin sketch example I just gave. And thirdly, retention, when you see something with your eyes, you're more likely to remember it than if you, it was just, if you just heard it or if it was words or numbers. So you're not gonna forget Curious George, you're not gonna forget Gumby because it accessed another part of your brain. Um, and I get into this, without getting into all the science, um, there's something called the picture superiority effect that says that pictures, when battling against text, pictures win. And dual coding theory is when you give information that um, is, that registers with both sides of the brain, metaphorically, left brain and right brain, it's more likely to increase your attention, comprehension, retention. So that's just a little bit of the brain science behind why this all works. Well, and you gave a great exercise at the beginning of the book uh, to flip through the book and see what you want to stop at. And mm -hmm. whoever stops at text, no, yeah, no stop yeah. at the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a question for you. When you think about a an executive that you're coaching and you're encouraging them to use visual thinking and visual communication. And they're sitting there going, you know, I've been such a left brain kind of mm -hmm. thinker, right? Maybe yeah. it's an engineer or just somebody that has been trained to use this logic mm -hmm. and not so much think in pictures, talk in pictures. It feels foreign to them. Yeah. How do you help them bridge that gap? Yeah. Well, one example of that is I was doing a Vistage workshop for a group of 20 CEOs on visual thinking. And I mentioned something about um, storytelling. And one of the CEOs said, I hate storytelling. I'm the worst storyteller role. I'm terrible at it. And I said, why do you say that? And he went on to tell this great story about why he's so terrible at storytelling. Right. And everyone else looked at him like that was so amazing. You, you you did such a great job. So a lot of times we put limitations on ourselves, like I can't draw or I can't tell stories. But storytelling is just part of 
uh, why visual thinking is so impactful as well is because we're just wired visually. That's just the way our brains are. If you hear rustling in the woods, you're going to turn around to see what's causing that, right? It's just going back to caveman time, times. That's just, even my dog does that. She hears the sound. She looks to see where it's coming from. So it's just, that's how we're wired. And same thing with using um, stories. Stories just resonate with people. The grandparents tell stories. Children tell stories. If, if you say, how was your day at work today? Oh, you wouldn't believe what happened to me. That's a story, right? So a lot of times we put those constraints on ourselves or, or um, and we may not be the greatest storyteller in the world, but you can always improve. It's, all of these things are things you could learn to be better at. So that's what I would say to an executive is I'll ask them about their hobbies. Let's say the executive plays golf. I'll say, tell me a golf story. Tell me about your worst day of golf or your best day of golf. And people can't wait to tell you about that, right? So as soon as that you engage them, you show them that they can do it. It's like, now tell me a story about the worst boss you ever had. Tell me about the story about the best team you were ever on. And then it's like, all of a sudden, these things bubble up to the surface. If As a manager, if you have to coach an employee, a new hire, for example, instead of saying, here's what you should do and shouldn't do, if you said to your employee, let me tell you about the biggest mistake I ever made when I had your job. Don't you think they're going to be on the edge of their seat, like waiting to hear that? And they're never going to forget that, right? So that's, again, the power. And if you could sketch it out, if you could do it on a napkin or a whiteboard or something like that, it's even more impactful. So again, those are some just simple examples of how I get people to realize you're already doing this, but now let's do it with more intention and, and improve your skill in these areas. Mm -hmm. I, I love the example you just gave about, uh, you know, a manager asking or telling a new employee um, about an experience they had, because it, it, to me, it sort of gives permission to that person to then open up yeah. and be honest about something they did or that yeah. happened to them. And so you can build this connection. Yeah more readily by shared experiences and shared stories. Yeah, one of my models I, when I do team building is um, I say that team bonding needs to come before team building, right? You can't just throw people together and give them hats and shirts and you're a team, whether it's a right. sport or a department, right? So team bonding, so how do you bond with people? You learn about them, you connect with them, you listen, you share stories and experiences. And my other part of that is that we need to connect to each other if we wanna work better with each other, right? So when a boss tells a story like that, um, shares something of themselves just as a professor with the students, like my example before, it humanizes you, it creates psychological safety, vulnerability, it allows the other person to open up. Um, it shows, you know, it, it reveals some of your personality, it reveals your values, right? That's a big part of leadership is what are your core values? So um, all of these things, um, just it's basically everything that everyone's already doing in management, leadership development and coaching only adds this visual spin to it and visual lens for lack of a better metaphor, which works. Um, and it's just a new way of seeing. And it's fun, to be honest, isn't like, you know, doing stuff like this is fun and entertaining. I tend to talk really fast, as you notice. My wife gave me this seashell to represent a snail shell to remind me to slow down when I talk, pause and take a breath. It doesn't work, but I keep it here anyway, just as a reminder. And someday I'll slow down. This is actually half my normal speed. So. Uh, <laughs> So my listeners who typically accelerate the speed of, of listening to the podcast won't be able to do that. As they may well. have to capture, slow it down. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> capture what you're saying. Well, you know, one of the things you did throughout the book, Todd, and, and I, honestly, some of your stories were just downright shocking in terms of how somebody could treat someone like this in the workplace. It was just abusive. And yet it stuck with me because of your storytelling ability. Um, share some of the stories around your bosses, both the really bad ones and the really good ones that you have found, because I want my listeners to hear more examples of stories and the impact that they can have as they listen to them and then get ideas on where they could draw from their own experiences to tell effective stories. Yeah, yeah, I'm not officially in the Guinness Book of World Records, but if there was a record for most bad bosses that any person could have in their career, I may hold that record because uh, it's just the luck of the draw. A big part of it is I worked in the entertainment industry for years and the big part of all, serious, you know, all seriousness, a big part of the entertainment industry, it's about creativity and producing amazing content, but the core values of Hollywood, in some ways, like Wall Street, are about money, power, ego, control. It's not about nurture. Like, like some of the companies right now, some of the big banks are like, all right, everyone get back to work. You know, we're still in a pandemic. Some people are not, in, you know, not quite settled yet. 
and they're all and many companies are like I don't want to name names, but I'm reading all these articles. They're saying, you know, I want we want everyone back to work by mid May or by mid June or whatever, with no empathy, compassion, no right. So, um, in fact, that's a huge opportunity. That's one of the things that we talk about right now. Is uh, you know, in the high right now where we're living in a hybrid world, and there's a lot of complexity that leaders are going to have to navigate to um, deal with this transition back to the to post pandemic world. But in terms of the bad boss that I've, I've had. Um, my boss, the story that people love the most, even my wife hates it the most because she wants to punch that boss in the nose. It was one day I was working at a TV network. I won't say which one, but it had a C, a B, and an S in its name. So I was working for them out in LA. I'm typing a memo. And then all of a sudden I heard my boss's door whip open. I felt something whip by my head and she had thrown a box of pens at me and started screaming at me in front of all of my peers because they were the, the wrong pens. She wanted the fine point and these were the medium point. Instead of just saying, hey, Todd, these are the wrong pens. And first of all, I ordered the right ones. The supply room just sent up the wrong ones. But anyway, she already had a whole collection of pens in her office, but it's just, that's how she gave, I, I say to my students when we talk about feedback, is there any other way you might have given your employee feedback that they ordered you the wrong pens? I can't think of anything else, but if anyone has any other ideas, let's talk about it. But that was just, she was just rageaholic. She was just, she was incompetent. She was insecure. She had imposter syndrome, which was not even a term back then, but that's what she had. And that was, and she once said to me, I actually, um, there's a book called right behind me that just came out yesterday called Anxiety at Work by Chester Elton and, uh, and Adrian Gostick. They wrote the books, all the carrot books and, and uh, Leading with Gratitude. The anxiety she produced in me, I mean, Sunday I'd start to get so anxious knowing I had to go back. It was like going back for abuse every, every week, right? Yeah. But I actually kept an abuse log that I mentioned. I have a picture of it in my book because I still have it. Um, but I once sat down and talked to her and I said, you know, can we figure out a way to work together and communicate because I want to do a good job. And she just basically yelled at me and said, stop whining. And she said, when I had your job, I was treated like crap. Uh, and now it's your turn. And if you don't like it, I can replace you tomorrow. So it's like, how do you navigate that? Um, one of the things that I was just on a, uh, a webinar with, with, uh, Chester and Adrian about anxiety at work. And one of the things they said is people, when they're feeling anxiety, should go to their boss and talk about how they're feeling. But I said, what happens when your boss is the cause of your anxiety, right? And, and they, that you don't have psychological safety. You can't say, hey, um, so that was just a horrible experience. This is a long story that goes beyond that. She ended up being fired. I ended up taking over her job and they kind of promised me her job after the pilot season and they ended up hiring someone else above me. And so they just lied to me to just get me to do her job for another like six months. So that was just the dysfunction of that culture and, and that climate. But uh, that led to a chapter later on where I, I coined the term PTBD, which is post-traumatic boss disorder, which is the stress and anxiety resulting from almost the shock of recollecting the abuse that you yes. suffer at the hands of horrible bosses. That was a very uh, profound chapter, even though it was quite short. Yeah. I would love for you to talk about that because I know there are people who are listening to me that are experiencing that same instant physical reaction yeah. when they either see the person in person as you did or a picture or something that reminds them of that. I want you to describe that, but then also talk about how you have worked through it yourself to recover from that experience. Yeah, I mean, I was so long story short, I was sitting in a meeting in person uh, pre pandemic. This is actually a couple of years ago because it was before, just before I wrote my book. And I'm sitting there and I look across the room and I see this woman's familiar face. And it was a former boss from 20 years before who was one of the, not the one who threw the box of pens at me, a different abusive boss. Um, she, this woman was just mean, evil, just a horrible person. And just seeing her brought back this rush of, anxiety and my heart started pounding. I actually got sick to my stomach. My hands were literally shaking. I started sweating. So I actually had to get up and leave this, this conference and go to the bathroom and put water on my face and calm myself down. And I went back in there and I just wanted to verify it was her. And um, I saw her one time after that. Um, but yeah, it just brought back all of these feelings of, of how I was treated and mistreated by her. And here it is, I'm a success, I'm success at this point in my life. It's 20 something years later. And yet I was reduced to that same person. It's kind of like the um, one of the things I, I don't write about in the book is I was bullied. I'm six foot four. I'm tall and thin. But I was always one of the kids who was like pushed around. But in high, junior high school and high school. So even though I was taller than the other kids because I was introverted and shy and nerdy. I had the thick glasses and the braces. And, you know, kids were like 
elbow me in the ribs or push me into the lockers and like all that kind of stuff that you see in Revenge of the Nerds kind of movies. I lived through that. So I'm very sensitive to bully, bullies, bullying bosses, uh, uh, you know, abusive people. And she just reminded me of that. It kind of, it's amazing how you can flat, it could reduce you back to your high school or junior high school self emotionally just the, the mental trigger of seeing this person. So um, I had to just remind myself that I'm a different person now. And I was going to confront her and just say, I don't know if you realize that you made my life a mis living hell for a year. I just decided to not do that because there was nothing that would have come. She might not have even remembered. Dale Carnegie once said that the words we say to someone or the things we do, we may forget two minutes later, but we'll may linger with that other person for the rest of their life. And that could be positive words, but it could also be negative words, right? And the abuse of some of these bosses still stays with me all these years later. On the plus side is my, bus, my book is dedicated first to my wife, secondly to my parents, and thirdly to all the horrible bosses without whom my career and this book would not be possible. So in that way, if you look back with humor and the stories and the learnings, um, you know, you try to see the, it wasn't fun at the time, but now I can look back and see the humor and the craziness of it all. So you've grown from that. I and believe so, hopefully. If, and when we flip that over to the really fabulous experience you had and the boss that you had that's still your good friend today mm -hmm. and co-instructor with you, what were, just talk a little bit about some of the things that were different about how he interacted with you. And if you can tie in your models, metaphors, and stories as you discuss that, that would be great. Yes. Yeah, so Jeff Schwartzman was my, uh, we, we were colleagues. So long story short about Dale Carnegie. I was always, like I said, an introvert. I had never in my life spoken in public in the first 35 years of my life. I mean, in, in school and any job, I was always just terrified and ter terrible at speaking in public and terrified of it. So I did everything to avoid it. After September 11th, um, New York was kind of in a depression and I was out of work. I had just broken up with someone. I was just kind of, I needed something to get out of the house. And I got this little flyer in the mail to go to a free Dale Carnegie training session. And I had heard of them. I had read how to win friends and influence people. So I went to it and I just was like inspired. It was just so I got, I signed up to take the course, the 12 week course. And I went to session one and at the break of the first session, I didn't like the instructor. And I almost left. I picked up my bag. I took my coat and I was going to go home. And then after the, the just as they were starting the second half, because they said everyone's going to have to speak after the second half. And I was so terrified of going, doing that. I almost left. So I was like, I actually got in the elevator, went down to the lobby. and was just about to head home on the subway. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go back up. Because if I go home, I'm going to be just depressed about not doing this. I forced myself to go back. And that's one of those crucible moments that's a turning point in my life. It's very rare that you have a single moment that like changes everything. Because I think if I didn't go back in, my career and life would have been very different. Like so many things that happened. So anyway, so I met Jeff, who was a fellow Dale Carnegie trainer. Turned out we grew up in the same town, five minutes apart. I went to Comac North High School. He went to Comac South High School in Long Island. Big Yankee fans. We both played on two or three softball teams, and we just really connected. They threw us together to, to do some workshops together. We got to be friends. Then he was hired by a company called Liquinet to be their chief learning officer. A year later, he wanted to create a leadership institute and hired me. Now, I wasn't going to go work for him because I never wanted to work for a Wall Street company. And I was kind of hesitant. He's younger than me by a few years. And he's, he was a good friend. So it's like to work for someone who is a friend and younger than you, it's just kind of, and in an industry that I had no interest in. But I took it and it turned out to be one of the best jobs and experience I've ever had. And I was working with him for three years. Um, and I got laid off after the financial crisis, um, which is when I started my company, Big Blue Gumbo. But we teach together at NYU. I still do all the leadership training at, at LiquidNet. He's still there 15 years later and we're great friends. And so that relationship has gone from peers and colleagues to, um, to his being my boss, to his being my client. And now we teach together and he has a whole chapter in the book about leadership lessons from Jeff. Cause he was just, he was just, he's generous. He's an extra extrovert. So he always kind of like, we balance each other out. I'm a details person. He's an extroverted piece, people person. We've each gotten better. And when you, you know, there's a saying as a team, T-E-A-M together, everyone achieves more. And it's just one of these partnerships where we make each other better and we have so much fun working together. So that's a uh, part of the Jeff story. Oh, that's, it's so good. I mean, you've just shared so many wonderful examples and you're just really the tip of the iceberg of all the stories that, that you packed into this book. Um, 
Tell us how you came to be able to provide such details to these stories. What was it you did over the years? Yeah, I mentioned earlier, I saw my freshman year of college, which I hate to give away my age, but that was September of 1980. Um, I started keeping a journal, just writing down like thoughts, feelings, things I did that day, even what I had for lunch, you know, whatever it was, I just wrote every day. And I did that throughout college. And I, one of the benefits of having OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is when you're obsessed with something that's positive and that's negative and not life inhibiting, I got obsessed with doing it every day. So I literally never missed a single day. And I still do that. And I haven't missed a day in 41 years of writing in my journal. So when I was writing my book, I was able to go back to my journals from 20, 25, 30 years ago and look up the names and dates and places. And it's also good for settling arguments. If I say to my friend, when do we see flash dance? Or what, what theater did we go to? And where did we go for dinner after that? I could take out my journal um, and look it up and, and settle a lot of arguments. When people say, oh, I never saw that movie. I say, yes, we saw it in Albany and, you know, in fall of 1982. So um, <laughs> that makes it fun. So that's, but anyway, that's, that's yeah. So that's, I encourage my clients to do that. Write down your thoughts, write down your fears, write down the things that are making you anxious write down ideas you have. It's interesting to look back at that and track your journey and your progression. So even if you're not doing it obsessively, just to, and if you do it with drawing and doodling, even all the better, it makes it easier to find what you're looking for. If you color code, I'm very, we haven't even talked about use of color, but I color code everything. Like here are all my markers. So I always think in terms of color. So some, if I'm writing about finance, it's green because that's money. If I'm writing about uh, leadership, that's usually uh red while well, management is blue and together they're purple. So it's like I have a color, that's the way my brain color codes and categorizes things. So I could find things and actually, if I'm actually talking about a topic, I actually see it in that color, which is just to get in the way I'm wired. You know, I love that you brought that up because I started marking my, my paper calendar that way. Mm -hmm. I ordered, I think it was about eight different colors of magic markers because yeah. I've been more, you know, just the regular pen or pencil. And I thought I'm going to add some color, some yeah. interest to this. And it's really fun yeah. to look my, at my, my calendar my, my, my and friend, know. My friend, Teresa, her, shout out to Teresa, her book, she's one of my biggest fans of visual leadership. Her bookshelf is color coded in the colors of the rainbow. So instead of having them by author or title, they're, by color. So if you look at her shelf, all the white jackets, red, blue, yellow, and it's just amazing. It's the her back backdrop behind her. And it's just, uh, it's one of those things that it's so attention getting, but it's also represents the, you know, she's such a rainbow colorful person that it's just, uh, it fits her personality and her, and her approach to things. Yeah. Well, just the idea of becoming more playful, lighten yeah. up a bit, you know, allow your inner child yeah. to come out and express some things instead of feeling like you have to be so, so rigid yeah. uh, as we're wrapping up here, Todd, cause we could talk for a long <laughs> time. There's still so much in your book. We didn't get to cover, but I would love for you to just share what are some key practical tips that you might share with my listeners to become more effective, you know, communicators and visual thinkers and mm -hmm. visual communicators as leaders but as you know, in their homes, in all aspects of their life. Yeah, so the it starts with awareness. So first it starts with, again, that rainbow eye. Remember that no one sees the world the way you do. So if you look at something and someone disagrees with you, it's because they're seeing it from a different lens. They're seeing it. So one of the hot topics right now is diversity, inclusion, belonging, equity. Um, you know, there's that saying, I forget who, I always forget who originated it, but in terms of the everything going on in the world right now, People say, oh, we're all in the same boat because we're going through this together, but we're not all in the same boat. We're all in the same storm, but we're each in different boats, right? Some people are in a yacht, other people are in a sinking road boat, right? So if you don't realize that, you think everyone's just going through the same thing. Um, Jamie Dimon the other day said, you don't like your commute, tough, deal with it, right? So it's like, there was no empathy. There was no compassion. What if you had a, we're taking care of a sick parents, aging parents or your kids or homeschooling them. So just to say callously, oh, tough, if you have to commute, you know, just deal with it. That's not empathy and compassion. That's not seeing things from other people's point of view. So that's, I think the key thing is realize that other people are experiencing things differently from you um, and, and view the world through that lens. And then we need, remind us to be, we're talking about visual, but also auditory. We need to listen more, right? We, we need to be able to listen with empathy and compassion and understanding. And one of the chapters in my book is the, um, is the whole body. It, it, it talks about, you know, we also talk about capturing people's hearts and minds, right? So heart is about passion, emotion. Mind is about the logic and the brain. Um, 
the hands to me represent joining forces, teamwork, collaboration, holding hands together to work together, and the feet represent action, motivation, what's going to get you to take that first step, right? And you can expand that metaphor to vision is about what are you seeing, but also your ears represent what are you listening, are you hearing, um, or are your ears shut, right? Um, when I'm teaching, there's the, the learning styles or learning modalities of VARC, visual, auditory, reading and writing, and kinesthetic. So we want to we want to leverage all the senses. So visual, what are people seeing? Auditory, what are people hearing and saying? Reading and writing is about capturing things um, by hand. And kinesthetics is about movements, it's about feeling, it's about experience, right? So those are all things that leaders could do is, are you using all your senses? Are you seeing things from multiple perspectives? Um, what is your vision? And how, are you, how, are you, how well are you communicating your vision? And how well are people aligning with that vision to turn it into a strategy that could be executed to turn that vision into reality. So everything we're talking about, it's not hypothetical or academic or theoretical. These are real practical tips, but seen through the, a different lens that maybe you hadn't thought about before. Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to encourage my listeners again to pick up a copy of your book, Visual you. Leadership, and that's Todd Churches. Todd, how can people connect with you and get your book? Where can they find it? Sure. Books available wherever books are sold, Amazon or anywhere else. And uh, the best ways to connect with me is uh, my website is toddchurches.com. And if you go to my website, you can download the PDF of my top 52 book recommendations that most impacted me and that will help you be a more visual leader. Um, and I live on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn all the time. So feel free to link in with me. Just say you saw me on Meredith's show and I'm happy to connect with you and, uh, and we'll follow each other and support each other. So uh, those are the best ways. That's great. Well, Todd, thank you so much for being with me today and with my audience. I just love what you shared and I love your book and really, again, want to highly recommend it to my listeners, thank you for what you're doing in the world to bring better vision and visualization and visual leadership thank you, to the world. Thank, thank you for having me and thank you for being so supportive of my work. I appreciate that. Thanks for tuning in to the Strong for Performance podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com slash free and grab our ebook, Listen Like a Pro. You'll find out how to connect on a deeper level with the people who matter to you. And while you're there, check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.